Welcome back. Just one problem will be covered in this video. That's number 49 from chapter eight, Physics for Scientists and Engineers, fourth edition by Randall Knight. This is the one about the, the classic amusement park ride where you're inside a room that's spinning. It's a circular room. And eventually, well, depending on the ride, they may lower the floor beneath you. And because the room, the room is spinning so fast, you develop a significant centripetal force on your body from uh, the contact with the wall. And that, that force which points towards the center of the room is sufficient to develop enough static friction to support your weight against gravity. So before we look at the analysis a little more in depth, let's watch some footage of an actual example. Uh, I'll point out that there is one at Castle Park in Riverside, California. I think it, I forget what they call it there, but here's another example. This particular ride evidently is in Australia and it's called the Gravitron. Did you hear what he just said there? 4.2 Gs. I guess he's estimating the centripetal acceleration that everybody in the room experiences. And you can see the room is starting to, to spin up. One of the passengers has got her feet off the floor there. <laughs> And let's skip ahead to when just about everybody has got their feet off the floor. Okay, now you can see that the walls are slightly inclined, which makes the analysis a little more complicated. We will leave out that complication and just assume that the, the walls of the room are vertical. And it's still possible for this, this room to operate as advertised with, uh, with vertical walls, but it would probably have to spin a little bit faster. So let's take a look now at the circular dynamics at play in this ride. I'll focus on this particular passenger. There's the ever-present gravitational force pulling down on the person. And you saw that for every one of those passengers later in the video, they were not standing on the floor. Now, if their body is not accelerating up or down, then they are in equilibrium in that direction. And that means there must be some force balancing gravity. And since it's not a normal force from the floor, you have to ask yourself, what else could possibly be supporting the weight of these people? Well, it's gotta be a contact force because remember in this class, the only force we talk about that does not involve actual physical contact between two objects is gravity. And we've already accounted for gravity. The only other thing touching the person is the wall. And since the force needs to be pointed that way, we recognize that must be a frictional force. Any contact force between two surfaces that's parallel to the surfaces, we classify as friction. And since they're not sliding up and down, that's gotta be a static friction force. So I will call it F sub S. And why do we even have static friction? Well, remember, you have to be pressing two surfaces together in order to get friction between them. And that force which describes how hard they're being pressed together is the force that points this way. And since that force is normal to the wall, remember normal is a fancy word for perpendicular to a plane, I'll call it the normal force. So in this problem, the normal force is not a force that's perpendicular to the floor, it's a force perpendicular to the wall. Now, let's look at this from the top down. Let's look at the circular path traced out by this, this person. So I'll just draw the top of their head. So they're going around and around. I guess you could think of this as the wall of the room. And from this perspective, the normal force would point this way towards the center of the circle. So we see it's the normal force providing the centripetal acceleration. Remember our coordinate system? We've got the, uh, let's say they're going around in this direction, counterclockwise. This would be the tangential axis. This is the radial axis. It point, points towards the center. So the origin of our coordinate system is here. And the Z axis actually points out of the page. So this is one of those rare problems where we do need to take a look at what's going on along the Z axis. Later, we'll do more problems having to do with banked roadways, 
uh, planes making turns, conical pendulums, those also require you to look at the z-axis. So it's the friction force which is coming out of the page and the gravity force, force which goes into the page. And that's gonna be difficult to draw on this diagram. So I'll just leave that out. And what the problem is really asking us for is, what's the minimum required rotational speed? How quickly does this room need to be spinning before the floor can be lowered and these people are being supported only by friction? Uh, you saw in the beginning of the video, most of the people still had their feet on the floor. That's because the room was not yet spinning fast enough. So let's think about this. Uh, we are told that the coefficient of friction between clothing and the wall, and you saw that the wall was upholstered. So we're given in the problem a range of typical values for coefficient of static friction between uh, the cloth of clothing or the fabric of clothing, and they actually give steel. So I guess in this problem, we're imagining a ride that does not have upholstered walls. 0 0.40 to 0 0.70. So what are we supposed to do with that? A range of coefficients? Well, we're supposed to, uh, to allow for the lowest possible coefficient, maybe some of the passengers are wearing clothes with a particularly low coefficient of static friction. I don't know, you know, flannel maybe has a low co coefficient of friction with steel and we need the ride to be spinning fast enough even for those people. So that means we go with the lowest. If it's spinning fast enough for this coefficient then it's certainly spinning fast enough for this coefficient because recall that the max possible static friction force is proportional to normal force. Now remember, once you get this thing up to speed, the friction force on any particular passion, passenger may not be the max possible. It's gonna be whatever it needs to be. Remember, static friction will always match the demand, so to speak. Like if this passenger weighs 80 pounds, if they're being pulled towards the floor by gravity with the force of 80 pounds, then the static friction force only needs to be 80 pounds, even if the possible static friction is as high as 120. It'll just be whatever it needs to be. Now, if the room's not spinning fast enough, maybe the normal force is so low that the max possible friction force on that particular passenger is only 70 pounds. So if the normal force is low enough that FS max is only 70 pounds, but the kid weighs 80 pounds, then friction will not be sufficient to support the weight of that passenger. And that means that the room would need to spin faster. Now we're gonna see that the rotational speed does not depend on the mass of the passenger, the mass will cancel. So I think we're ready to apply Newton's laws here along our special coordinate system. So again, if you wanna see the, the axes drawn, this is the T axis, this is the R axis, Z is coming out of the page. I use my right hand to see that T, R, Z comes out of the page. Okay, let's start by saying, or by recognizing that, again, there's no acceleration along this axis. This person in circular motion must have a centripetal acceleration towards the center of their circular path. There's no acceleration along this axis. So the sum of the forces along the Z axis can be zero. R axis, z-axis. That would mean that the static friction force minus mg is equal to zero. So fs is equal to mg. This is a requirement. In order that the passenger not fall towards the floor, this must be satisfied. Now along the radial direction, it's the ever familiar FR or F sub R equals mass times centripetal acceleration. Remember, you can only use this acceleration or you can only use this formula, I should say, with one of these accelerations if you're moving in a circle. If you're spiraling out of a circle, this is no good. You would need an additional term here or terms, I forget. Okay, which one gets the plus sign? Well, in this case, there's only one force along the R axis. That's the normal force and it does point towards the center so we give it a plus sign. And which of these should we use? Well, we're being asked to find the minimum required RPM or revolutionary uh, rotational speed. So 
this is clearly uh, the most convenient formula. R omega squared. So that's two of the three ingredients here. We know that the static friction force has to balance their weight. Um, we know that the normal force comes from the centripetal acceleration. And lastly, well, I've actually kind of written it here already, didn't I? Yeah, I'll put it this way. Fs max is equal to mu times the normal force. And that max possible static friction force needs to be at least as great as a passenger's weight. Maybe that's the most logical way to approach this problem. We know that the max possible friction is proportional to normal force. And that friction force must be at least as great as the person's weight if they're gonna be prevented from falling. So now we substitute for normal force. We got that by looking at the dynamics along the radial axis. So that means that mu times mr omega squared must be greater than or equal to uh, the, the person's weight. And I'm using weight in this context just to mean gravitational force. So there it is. The normal force, or I should say the friction force, which is coefficient times normal force must be at least as great as the person's weight. Now we see that the mass cancels. Let's solve for omega or omega squared must be greater than or equal to G over mu R. And of course, now we can take the square root of both sides. In other words, the minimum allowable angular speed in radians per second will be G over mu R. And now I can plug in numbers here because we were told in the statement of the problem that the diameter of the room is five meters. So the radius is just two and a half. And I have to locate my calculadora. I made it materialize out of thin air. There, here it is. 9.8 divided by that uh, lower limit for static friction, static friction coefficient between clothing and steel. That was the 0.4. And also divided by 2.5. See what I did there? Repeated division. And I don't trust that number. I think I did something wrong. 9.8 divided by 0.4 divided by 2.5. Okay, coincidence. It comes out to be 9.8 radians per second. Now in the statement of the problem, they'd like to know what that angular speed is in uh, revolutions per minute. So here's a good conversion factor to remember. It's, it's approximate, so it's good in a pinch. 9.8, this time I'll actually write radians per second. Let's convert that into rev per minute. Well, every uh, revolution has two pi radians. Hey, I knew I was doing this wrong. Don't be like me. Okay, we want radians to cancel. There are two pi radians in every one revolution. And lastly, we have to convert from seconds into minutes. We wanna cancel seconds. So up here, I'll put there are 60 seconds for every one minute. And we see that radians cancel, seconds cancel, and the units come out as we'd like, revolutions per minute. And look here. Two times pi, isn't that roughly six? To the nearest integer, that would be six. 60 over six is 10. So every one radians per second is about 10 rev per minute. You can just basically multiply by 10 if you're interested in uh, just an approximate answer. I'll be a little more exact here. 9.8 divided by two divided by pi times 60. And this comes out to 93.6 rev per minute. I guess that sounds realistic. Isn't that like one and a half per second? Yeah, divided by 60. One and a half revolutions every second, which is pretty quick. If you think back to the video, do you think that uh, that room 
when you looked at it from the outside, was it really going around once or one and a half times every second? It looked like it was moving pretty fast. According to the solutions manual here, the minimum angular speed is 24 RPM. What did I do uh, wrong? <coughs> did I forget to take this? I did, I forgot to take the square root. So I'm, I'm setting a great example here of what not to do. Um, uh, what I can do is just take the converted form. I thought that sounded a little fast. We don't want people puking in the middle of the ride. Uh, that, that could be entertaining, but not for a family ride. Uh, 93.6. I'm still not getting the right answer. Why is that? So does that not work? I can't take the square root after converting. It seems like that should work. Let me try this one more time. 9.8 divided by 0.4, divided by two and a half meters is the radius, hit equals, take the square root sign. There's my 3.13, which is basically 30. Okay, so the book is saying 24. Um, yeah, to me that, that should be close to 30, but I'll try dividing by two, dividing by pi times 60, 29.8, as opposed to 24. So I'm gonna pause and see if I can locate the error there. I assume that's rounding, but it shouldn't be that different. Okay, I see what happened. I didn't read the problem carefully enough. This was the range of values for kinetic friction. For static friction, uh, which tends to be greater, the coefficients are actually 0 0.60 to some upper limit, which we don't even need, 1.0. Yeah, remember your book likes to give you information you don't need. We don't need coefficients of kinetic friction in this ride because the assumption is that they're not sliding up and down the wall. So if I go with the lower limit of 0.6 in here, uh, you'd get probably something like 2.5 radians per second as your minimum angular velocity in SI units. After, um, after converting, you would find that the minimum rotational speed is more like 24 RPM. Remember, in an automobile, the, the uh, Drive shaft coming out of the engine is turning at something like 2000 RPM when you're idling. So we know that it should be way less than that. We, we don't wanna be spinning around in a room as fast as the pistons in an engine. And that's it for that. So the, the difficulty with this problem, besides reading the, the problem carefully enough, is the fact that the Z axis uh, does appear. You have to look at the dynamics along the Z axis. In this case, the person's in equilibrium along the Z axis. And you have to recognize that that um, minimum, let's see here, uh, minimum angular velocity corresponds to maxing out the friction force. Remember, if you spun the room even faster, your normal force would go up even more. And that means your max friction force, max possible friction force would go up even more, but you wouldn't necessarily need that max friction force in that case. You just need the friction force to match everybody's weight.